I'm really happy to see you all here, and it is my distinct honor and pleasure to uh, welcome our guest today, Rupa Singh. Um, Rupa's going to be delivering a talk today that's titled Precious and Slumdog Millionaire, Beyond the Urban and the Melodramatic, Integrating American Popular Culture. So today's colloquium uh, provides a welcome opportunity to engage with culture, media, film studies, theory that's related to everyday global rhetoric as well. So in terms of um, what has brought Rupa to where she is today, um, I'll give you just a quick sort of background and then a quick background of the paper and then we'll move on right away to um, our awaited presentation. So Rupa has um, worked in a variety of capacities. She worked in prisons as a lawyer and as an edu educator before transitioning into academia about three years ago. She teaches on law and hip hop and popular culture in the political science departments at uh, City College and Pace University. Uh, after receiving her law degree from UC Berkeley, Rupa says that her investment in popular culture led her to NYU. She's currently getting her master's degree in cinema studies, and she's also a yoga instructor and blogs on popular culture at um, a site called Political Poet. Um, and if you haven't seen this, you should go. It's, it's an amazing site. I visit it actually regularly. So um, you should definitely go and check this out. So her paper today offers us an opportunity um, to reflect upon and inquire into the nature of Indian film and hip hop's integration into American popular culture. This is the abstract that she's working from and the sort of questions that are guiding her through her paper today. She writes, in cinema studies, Indian films tend to be categorized as melodrama and in the mainstream market, contempor uh, contemporary African American films often fall under the urban category. She asks, are these tropes too narrow, or are they just what they need to be at this stage of integration and in American popular culture? Her paper today is going to argue that rights-based integration involving real property is necessarily supplemented, even complemented, by cultural integration involving intellectual property. That is, the powerful spectacle of integration or of black sit-ins at white only lunch counters can and should be superimposed over the integration of popular cultural topography of America. What has the integration of American pop popular culture looked like thus far, she asks. In a uh, cultural aggregate fashion, this paper pulls from legal scholarship, two films that recently attained high visibility within the American cultural landscape, Precious and Slumdog Millionaire, as well as the emerging field of hip hop studies. So let's give a warm welcome today to our friend Rupa Singh. Thank you. So good afternoon, barely. <laughs> Thank you so much, Christine and the South Asian Studies Department for having me today. I'm really glad to be here. So, um, I first got interested in the topic of the emergence of South Asians in American popular culture through this lifelong sport of uh, what the South Asian Journalists Association calls Daisy spotting. It's kind of like this preternatural interest and concern uh, in seeing another Indian person on the street. We're like, oh shit, are you Indian? Where are you from? <laughs> there's, this, there's this instinct that we have. Um, to almost like catalog each other. More specifically, the phenomenon uh, that was Slumdog Millionaire and a host of firsts that emerged in 2009 um, struck me. Uh, all of a sudden, after Slumdog Millionaire came out, people were asking me about my, my nation, um, or one of my nations. So I began to see Slumdog Millionaire as kind of a passport to visibility, uh, an entree, a conversation starter. Uh, suddenly being Indian mattered, and there was a relational plane uh, created across the board uh, amongst the folks in, in my hood, uh, on the bus, uh, amongst folks in uh, academia, in 
in my department. There was a, a relational plane that was created upon which people could connect to me, not just as uh, Rupa, but also as Rupa from India. Um, so something about that movie added to, uh, added to the layers of what it meant to be Indian, almost resurrected our visibility. And yet the film also landed in a brittle atmosphere, which was not focused on the fact that uh, the prolific Bollywood film industry was still relatively unacknowledged, even superseded by Slumdog. That wasn't the focus of that, of that brittle landing. Um, it wasn't that it was a white director of essentially an all Indian movie. That wasn't the focus. Um, instead, the context of that brittle atmosphere was created by a public outcry or protest around the, the core inquiry of how were the children treated? Was there exploitation happening in this film? And so blog sites, all, uh, uh, all kinds of coverage of the movie focused on that, on that core question. About a year later, that almost exact same uh, brittle context, breakable context, happened in response to the movie Precious, based on the novel Push by Sapphire. Uh, there, the outcry from folks like Ishmael Reed was against the film's supposed vilification of the black family, in particular black men and black mothers. The idea there was that black people were once again being profiled uh, for the profit of Hollywood and for mass appeal. That the two receptions one to Slumdog Millionaire and the other to Precious are parallel is of great interest to me. How is it that these two films end up landing in the same way? Um, but not only do these two individual films land in the same way, they represent what's just the current peak of a much longer mountain. So, Slumdog Millionaire's reception is built on the back of Salam Bombay's reception, which in turn was built on the back of the reception of Bader Panchali, arguably the first sort of crossover hit out of India into the West. Um, this is a film by Satyajit Ray. This is a film by Mira Nair. Uh, when both of those films landed, the discussion was very, very, very similar. Is this quote unquote poverty porn? Are we exploiting our people, in particular our children, uh, to gain visibility in the West? Precious is predated or has its predecessor in the reception to Alice Walker's The Color Purple, which is also linked to the discussion surrounding Halle Berry's role in Monsters Ball, also Denzel Washington's role in Training Day, for which he received uh, an Oscar. Do you guys know what I'm talking about when I say the reception to color purple? Maybe? Is there, are there any maybes in the house? <laughs> well, just in case there are, when Alice Walker's book first came out, which then got turned into the movie, financed by Oprah Winfrey, which uh, Precious is also financed by Oprah Winfrey and her new partner, uh, and a, a newer partner. Um, the idea was that uh, it was vilifying black men and the black family. When Monster's Ball came out, it was that Halle Berry was in the movie depicted as sleeping with this, uh, this man who killed her husband. Um, and so there was this idea that the black woman was not strong, uh, that she was not a good mother, same thing in The Color Purple, same thing in Precious. When uh, Monique received her Academy Award for her, her role in Precious, the response was that she was only given this award in, re in return for portraying a black mother in a negative light. That Halle Berry was only given her award in return for uh, portraying a black woman in a negative light. That Alice Walker, um, you, got, you guys catch my drift, right? My sense is that the reception to these films is intimately linked with how racialized or nationalized communities are initially integrated into American popular culture in the first place. That, uh, that is, I believe that if the initial entree 
if the initial tropes were more expansive, the films down the line would be able to land in a more flexible atmosphere, less brittle, less focused on simply one layer of what the film's import is, wherein each community is not torn between feelings of pride at the amplification on one hand and hypervigilance on the other hand. Um, that hypervigilance being akin to the sense of, why are they showing us like this? How, how could they depict us like this? How is America seeing us? I had a chance to talk to Mira Nair about the reception to Salam Bombay, so I'm just going to share a little bit of that. What I had just asked her in this clip is I had asked her about an article that came out in the New York Times um, once Salam Bombay landed, and the article was focused on what happened to the children. What happened to the children in Salam Bombay? And they, they sort of I think they half quoted her. So this is like a, her, her ability to, uh, to round out that quote. With Salam, making Salam Bombay um, a big inspiration that gave me the courage to make that film was a Brazilian film called Pichot by Hector Babenco. And, um, and when I remember very well uh, the day we began to shoot Salam Bombay in the headlines in uh, India was the fact that the young boy playing Pichot had been killed uh, in Brazil that day. And it was something that was a hugely sobering sort of call uh, to what we already knew, which was that when you work and you make a story that is as truthful as Salam Bombay is about street kids, and you're using and working with street kids to play themselves, that that comes with an enormous you know, responsibility. And not finding any institutions in Bombay that really uh, honored street kids for being who they were, uh, but had a very missionary sort of rehab, let's rehabilitate them and put them back on the streets kind of approach, which was not our approach at all. Uh, we decided to use the profits of the movie to create something like that, that would honor them as street kids, but also give them a childhood, give them a future. <clears throat> so actually, we created Salam Balak Trust, uh, Balak means child, and uh, in 1988, the year the film came out. And uh, we started with one center for street kids in Bombay and one for Delhi. And now we have close to 17 centers. And 22 years later, uh, 5,000 kids come through our centers in both these cities. And uh, so it's a very um, thriving, um, active um, place that, that is first, actually, you, many of our kids in Salam came and worked in our centers. Then they were set off to do their own thing. But um, so we are, you know, directly engaged in street kids and have actually impacted government policy about them. And Danny Boyle and Lavine, who are the two directors of um, Slumdog, had, we we had we they know fully well our work and 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 uh, I invited them to be a part of this as well if they would so choose to be. Yeah. So it was one of those rare films that was started by the idea of if art could actually change something in the world. And it's one of those rare opportunities where I feel like it's directly plugged into that and has mm -hmm. really changed the world for street kids. Identities on the American film and television screen are closely monitored. From the urban flight housewives acculturating to an appliance filled life in 1950s era American suburbs, to pre and post Civil War representations of African Americans first as slavery welcoming, then as slavery needing, the screen has told the American public who it is. There is a difference between being reflected on screen and being corralled. Reflection is when you see how you feel, when you see how you look, how you experience this infinite unfurling of life inside the visage of another. Perhaps reflection is seeing women on the screen who look and act like my mother. I believe that reflection is necessarily political. Who gets on screen gets seen. Kind of like the census. Did you guys turn in your census forms? 
Yeah? Kind of like the census. <coughs> Except here, it's not who is counted, but indeed who counts. If the screens of American popular culture took their cue from a census-like uh, survey, then what would television programming and cinema blockbusting look like? The First Amendment does not articulate within it a right of reflection, but it has been interpreted to include within its protections the dual right to speak and be heard. So a lot of people understand the First Amendment as the right to free speech, right? The right to public assembly. Um, but it's not just the right to, to speak. It's also the right to be heard. Because, of course, what would the right to speak be if no one could hear you? Um, also included under the First Amendment are the right of assembly, petition, religion, the fair use exception to the Copyright Act. The magnitude of media's infrastructure today and, influ uh, and influence on the nation state would not and could not have been imagined though by the, by the framers. So it's not a far stretch then to say that the rights found within the First Amendment include the right of reflection the right to see oneself, the right to be seen on this new terrain of nationhood. Uh, perhaps there, there are multiple terrains of nationhood. One being, first and foremost, the body of the citizen, um, regulations of the body, and how our bodies get to move here, get seen. Uh, another might be the media as a, as a new nationwide terrain. Allegorical, uh, so the right to be seen, if we, if we interpret within the First Amendment, a right of reflection, a right to be seen within popular culture in the country, uh, then, then what we're talking about is a, another bundle of citizenship rights. So we all have this bundle of citizenship rights. And perhaps a stick within that bundle is the right to be seen, the right to be reflected. If that's the case, then maybe that's allegorical to the right of the former slave to upgrade from three-fifths of a vote to be counted as a whole and full person, where it was one man and one vote. Um, perhaps to see one's own narratives on screen marks a growing edge for the ever-present quest for full citizenship. I don't know if you guys saw this. Um, there was a BBC article on uh, the, a poetry contest, kind of like Amer uh, an American Idol, but focused on poetry. And uh, a woman, uh, the women in Burka, who get up and recite poetry, and one woman in particular who decided to um, recite a piece about basically rule of law uh, or the abuse of rule of law in her nation. I just saw this film that I was telling Christine about called Afghan Star. Um, and Afghan Star is kind of like the, uh, the Afghan American Idol. So on Afghan Star, people are singing. Uh, two women in Burqa were, uh, were on Afghan Star, and one of them took off her, her hijab, and she uh, sang without any covering on her head. She also danced. Right after that, she received multiple death threats. But so did her counterpart, who remained clad, in her, in her veil, and also uh, didn't dance, she also received threats. It made me think. If we take a look at our most recent and our current wars in the Middle East, we might be able to get a sense of the importance of the terrain of media. <coughs> it's commonly understood in this country that the war was being fought and is being fought for a, a few core reasons. One of them uh, definitely being the freedom, that we're fighting for the freedom of women in these countries, the equality of women in these countries. When we see, however, the reaction to the recent ascendancy of women to the screen platform in Afghanistan and the resulting death threats across the board, whether or not the women are covered, whether or not the women are moving, whether or not they are singing, the main thing seems to be that the women dare to be present on the platform independently without a man, that they're exerting a kind of independent sovereignty on this new uh, terrain of nationhood, of nation building in their, in their countries. 
So we have to ask ourselves, uh, I suggest that we ask ourselves that if these death threats uh, are coming, regardless of what the women are doing on screen, then is there any way that our efforts in those countries have climbed, chipped away at uh, one in this particular pursuit? Much was made of the fatwa that was put on Salman Rushdie. Um, I wonder if the ever-present death threat for women who are interested in speaking or who are interested in being on a, on a, on a screen platform is on the same plane, just less recognized. The U.S. is now host to the second largest Indian diasporic site on the planet, and yet the first regular emergence of an Indian on the American popular culture screen came with one representation in the 1990s. Who was that? Can you guys guess? <coughs> yes. You get an extra cup of coffee if you want. <laughs> Um, let's just go through these first real quick. Here's just some, some basic hallmarks. So first public translation of an Indian work in the West, Shakuntala, the Sir William James translation. Then uh, the first U.S. release motion picture on India, Hindu Fakir, that was in uh, 1902. 1950s and 1970s, uh, in terms of the South Asian integration of American popular culture, had a bunch of one-hit wonders, just like one-time screenings of South Asians, in particular Indians, and then also white people performing Indianness or being coded as Indian slash um, performing in brownface. So that included uh, in the 50s one-time spots by Indian performers on the Ed Sullivan Show, on Omnibus, The Tonight Show. Um, in the very first Star Trek movie there was uh, an Indian beauty queen who performed as Lieutenant Ilya. Um, there was a bunch of people who were coded as Indian, including uh, Khan on Star Trek, um, Punjab on Annie, um, Korla Pundit. Fast forward then to 1990, uh, the debut of the first steady Indian presence on American TV is with The Simpsons in an episode called The Telltale Head. Apu didn't start being a regular presence on The Simpsons until a few years later, like mid-90s, later 90s, and it wasn't until a few years after that that we actually saw Apu um, in the context of his family. So we saw his wife uh, many years later. In a way, it's kind of like a stratified Bracero program, how it emerged, which is that uh, initially South Asians on American popular culture screens are just are male and they're workers. They don't have families. And uh, the screen is not overly concerned with um, Indians as multi-generational or as family-based. Um, <coughs> I came across this article on Indian-themed comedies being a new TV trend about a post, uh, a post slumdog millionaire interest in India. And one of the quotes in the article says that, um, that India is in the midst of a rapid emergence onto the US popular culture scene. Okay, that's, that might be true. At the same time, Indians have been in the country for, for quite a long time. Um, there was the a few people that came in through Salem that were relatively hard to document. Um, this is from Vijay Prashad. Uh, then there was a deeply political wave of around 6,000 Indian immigrants um, between the late 1800s and the early uh, 1900s. Then because of that populace's willingness to fight for equality, immigration stilled to a trickle until 1965 when Congress passed the Immigration and Nationality Act after which the wave of uh, Indian and South Asian immigrants expanded exponentially. Between 1966 and 1977, around 100,000 Indian people, mainly men, arrived in the US. So whether or not we're in the midst of a rapid emergence onto the US popular culture scene is arguable. Um, rapid if we take kind of a narrow look. So, Abu's emergence is interesting because it kind of parallels the, the African-American integration of American popular culture in the sense that it's a, it's a heavily controlled role. Um, Abu was depicted as a, a buffoon character, laughable, 
a hard worker, working class. Early African American integrators of the screen sometimes justified their decision to perform heavily controlled uh, racialized identities by pointing out that at least they were bringing home a paycheck, money back into the community, in addition to paving a path, albeit slow, for the integration of African Americans into American popular culture. But in the case of the still emerging Indian presence in American popular culture, there was no narrow capital to glean off of Apu for the Indian community. Why? Because he was an animated character. That's first. Second, he, he was voiced by somebody who's, not, who's also not South Asian, um, Frank Aziz. In addition to, uh, so in addition to being animated, he's, Apu has never been voiced by an Indian or a South Asian person, but in some sense, a path was paved. <coughs> Generally, representations of Indian people still flow down either the Apu stream or uh, the terrorist stream. Men coders at, coded as Indian, largely working class, continue to be presented as laughable, emasculated, gullible, infantile. Uh, there was a, a moment in time when David Letterman featured two Bangladeshi store clerk, uh, sort of like 7-Eleven type South Asian men, um, also as, as laughable presences. And uh, he always referred to them as the boys. Um, but tides are fast changing and a post dog millionaire atmosphere has piqued corporate interest in Indians on screen. The time is ripe for a fuller emergence of South Asians into American popular culture, which means that it is also a good time to assess where we've been, where we're at, and where we're going. As I work on this project, this paper, I'm particularly interested in historic patterns of how integration of American popular culture really goes down. What are those patterns like using African American integration as a seminal model? I think it's very illustrative for us. It could be very instructional. Um, I'm also interested in doing just kind of an assessment, an archival assessment of what we've done so far. Uh, when, I, when I started researching the paper, I realized that there's not a lot um, out there in terms of the, the archive of the Desi spottings. Um, so that's, that's the other real interest that I have. Here's some of where we're at right now. Um, on the TV screen in particular. Why would I use African American um, performance in popular culture as a parallel? Well, since I teach on hip hop, one of the things that, uh, that I've discovered is that hip hop is essentially, you can, you can talk about hip hop a lot of ways, but one of the ways that I like to talk about it is as a cultural fruition of, of, of legal rights attainment. So that the Civil War era resulted in the passage of a number of laws which allowed for equality, recognition, access to all people, ideally, all right? Kind of a generalization, but ideally. In response then to, to that opening, to that equality, there is a more fertile soil, and that formerly oppressed group of people can, can bear the fruits of that freedom, which can be seen as a kind of cultural fruition. The rights-based attainment doesn't just stop there. It foresees a future for that people um, that is more fruitful. And I think that hip-hop is a kind of cultural fruition uh, of the civil rights movement. If we see it that way, it takes on a different political edge. There are hip hop artists, uh, many actually, uh, who have actual lineage within, within the black power movement. Uh, one of them is um, an artist from Mob Deep, who uh, unfortunately he's passed away of sickle cell, but his, his grandfather was one of the founders of Morehouse College, a historically black university in the South. Um, his father uh, ended up going to jail on some black liberation army stuff. And then here he is, you know, a hip hop artist continuing to bring a message. The core idea here uh, that I'm trying to get at is that integration happens first through rule of law relations between the nation state and its citizens, 
such as the creation of new laws, which are first warred over, then codified, and eventually enforced. That's civic integration. Um, what I'd like to focus on with this paper, as it proceeds, is on the next layer, or the second phase of integration, uh, what I refer to as the cultural fruition phase. Legalized integration includes as its goals both equal access um, and later, once a generation has the time to move past war and into new spaces of humanization, the cultural attainment that results. Um, so actively placing hip hop in a citizenship based context because re uh, reflection is necessarily political. This is a, a quote from an article in the journal Kalalu, and the article is entitled True Heads, Historicizing the Hip Hop Nation in Context. In whose critical jurisdiction does the discussion of hip hop and nation lie? Does the construction of hip hop as an essentially African American cultural space necessarily deny the hybrid reality of the text and the range of disparate influences that have contributed to hip hop's development so far. To study hip hop is to study history. Canonical works in the still emerging field begin with the South Bronx, South Bronx via Jamaica creation story and branch out into cultural parameters or the four elements of hip hop. So almost every single work that you're gonna read right now on hip hop that's like a seminal work, um, that's like Jeff Chang's Can't Stop, Won't Stop, um, Trisha Rose's Black, uh, Black Noise. It's going to start with, here's how hip-hop was created, a creation story. And then it's going to go into the four elements. <coughs> Why? Because that's how it goes on the street. The original hip-hop scholars, who are still existing now, um, lacking free access to institutional houses, schooled themselves and others in their community in this way. Here's how we started with our creation story, and here's where we went immediately with our four elements. It was the South Bronx. It was a political policy of benign neglect. Economic objection, so deep that the only uh, international visitors to, to the South Bronx at that time were Mother Teresa. Where else is Mother Teresa? In Calcutta, right? Of course, she's going around visiting a lot of places, but that was a highly publicized visit. The South Bronx was almost post-war. It was, it was war-torn. Bombed out shells of buildings, barely there facades of civil services. Uh, the visual is definitely of war. From this chaos emerges a new youth and immigrant-fed culture called hip-hop. The four elements of hip-hop are the core tenets of almost any cultural identity. They cover physical movement, which is what in hip-hop? Break dancing. It covers visual art. Yeah. It covers speech or language. Yeah, rapping, rhyming. Uh, and it covers rhythm or beat making, which in this case was an innovative use of turntables by DJs called scratching. This is the creation story. These are the instruments for telling, uh, uh, for telling the hip hop narrative. But why, why is talking about hip hop scholarship something that seems so history based? Why is it that to study hip hop is to study history, even as hip hop is still existing, still creating? <coughs> has hip hop come to pass or has hip hop come to last? I mean, one of the, one of the uh, places of real interest I have with this paper is that I really feel like if we're going to um, embody the integration of hip hop into academia, that we should try and keep some of the core tenets of what hip hop meant, even as it's, it's housed in the hallowed halls. Um, and you know, if hip hop was about anything in the beginning, it was about being civically engaged on one's own terms talking how you want to talk, dancing how you want to dance, moving how you want to dance, and still being acknowledged as a full citizen um, on a political platform. In a New York Times article uh, dated February tw uh, 26, 2004, um, 
this dude Elvis Mitchell, he says, America's most powerful cultural export right now is hip hop. It is the language of the young around the world. In Rome, your French-born cab driver may be singing along to an outcast track. So hip hop emerges as a particularly public music, particularly public sphere. Why is this important for the integration of South Asian Americans into American popular culture, or South Asians into American popular culture? Um, for, for a number of reasons. I'm gonna hone in for just a second on, on the copyright reason. Since hip hop's emergence uh, as, as a place of citizenship building, as a cultural fruition of the civil rights movement, it has been um, seen to be a big money maker, heavily commodified, and then as soon as it was seen to be a big money maker, there was a rush in to, to regulate it, specifically through copyright law. Um, I feel like this could be illustrative for our own rapid emergence onto the popular culture scene, because as soon as we're seen to be able to make money, um, uh, all of a sudden we have more visibility, all of a sudden the door may or may not open to increase control um, over our industry, over our cultural fruition of a relatively long uh, rights-based movement worldwide. So copyright is interesting for that, for that purpose. I'm just going to go into what the paper is in relation to in terms of what, um, in terms of other conversations. But first I just want to take a quick glance at 2009. So 2009 is kind of an important year for our emergence onto the popular culture scene. And when I say we and our, I don't, I'm not saying that in order to exclude anybody who does not identify as South Asian or as Indian, being bicultural and binational myself, that's not really where I'm at. I'm not trying to exclude anybody, but I am definitely invested as a South Asian scholar in, um, in identifying with who I am. I'm proud of who I am. So uh, that's, that's where I'm coming from with we and our, FYI. So 2009, um, Jay Sean comes out as the first solo South Asian artist to top uh, the Billboard Hot 100 with his American debut single, Down. Uh, incidentally, he is he only comes out with Down after he signs to Cash Money, which is a hip hop uh, record label, Little Wayne's hip hop record label. He then becomes the most successful British uh, European male urban artist in U.S. chart history. All of a sudden, we go from having nobody on that chart to having the most successful. MIA in 2009 is on high rotation with Swagger Like Us on radio stations all across the country. Um, she performs at the 2009 Grammys with hip hop kingpins, Jay-Z, T.I., Lil Wayne, Kanye. Not only does she perform becoming the first South Asian woman to perform in the Grammys, but she performs nine months pregnant. Um, really showing herself. Slumdog Millionaire sweeps the 2009 Academy Awards with eight Oscars. Um, but perhaps most illustrative is Cal Penn. So Cal Penn ascends from uh, being terrorist typecast, sort of like buffoon typecast in his movies, um, and in the show 24, or around 2001, to movie star, to adjunct faculty member in the Asian American Studies Department um, at Penn. Uh, he taught a class called Images of Asian Americans. I think what's most important here about the fact that he's teaching that class is that the people who are still doing it, the folks who sort of pushed for the first emergence, are the people who are studying it, are then the people who become um, political representatives, literally, because then he uh, becomes the associate director in the White House's Office of Public Liaison and Intergovernmental Affairs, a position that I've, I've heard that he's leaving to go back um, to, to performing again full time. Uh, so what other work is my paper in conversation with? Of course it's related to South Asian studies, hip hop studies, cinema, um, cosmopolitanism, constitutional law, immigration law, with that, that whole Bracero comparison, political philosophy. Um, but perhaps uh, most interesting for me, what I, what I wanna leave off on, 
is I've been reading Discipline and Punish. I've heard that maybe you guys are, are reading that or have read it in classes. So I'd like to, to think about how to use that carceral theory, Foucault's carceral theory, in relationship to the media and to popular culture. How would I relate the two? Why would the two relate at all? One of the ways is because rights function in tiers, in classes, casts, uh, kind of a grayscale. And the right to privacy, for example, found in the Fourth Amendment exists in terms that progressively narrow and widen. We're always on the scale of how much privacy do you get, how much privacy do you not get? What kind of citizen have you been? If you're in prison, you don't get much privacy. If you're law-abiding, you get more privacy. But we're always on a scale that's relational. Uh, that, that scale is relational to each other. Uh, I feel like that, that gray scale is by default uniting. Um, this placement on, uh, on an axis, our placement on an axis, <coughs> Um, alongside incarcerated people places us on this relational plane, a constantly existing polarity between us and them. Most of the time, society is media analyzed under an umbrella of freedom from one end of the grayscale. But if we are on the same axis as the incarcerated, then perhaps it is as legitimate to use the umbrella of imprisonment the total loss or forfeiture of the expectation of privacy as a lens for society. This then the reasoning behind using the carceral model or trying to use the carceral model as an instructive tool with which to study popular culture. I know that there are critiques to, to discipline and punish. Um, one being by Joy James uh, in the book Resisting State Violence, Radicalism, Gender and Race in U.S. Culture where um, uh, the critique is offered that Foucault's discipline and punish ignores the ongoing public punishment of racialized bodies. But I also really feel like some of his ideas are, are helpful for, for, for where I'm going. So one would be the unequal gaze. The knowing and seeing in unequal levels um, where, where one end demands transparency of everything except its own operations. And let me tell you, as I was researching this paper, one of the interesting things was how hard it was to find super basic information, very basic information, um, which piqued my curiosity. So uh, when I was looking into, say, the, the, the top TV shows over the past few decades, um, I ended up having to go to Nielsen itself. And I don't know uh, if you guys know this, but Nielsen is the primary, and has been, the primary recorder of television uh, uh, ratings for a while. Um, so they're our, our main go-to source for that information, but we have no access as scholars to that, to that body of information. Every question that I would need to ask that person, it turned out that I would have to pay a couple hundred dollars for every question I would have to ask. There is no scholarly um, facility within that Nielsen operation. So all that information is not available to us, as it should be, I, I feel. Um, so another, uh, another aspect of that, of that theory that I feel like is important for, for this paper is the, the idea of docile bodies. Um, there, are, there are core scenes in the movie Precious where abuse is happening between Precious and her mother in front of a TV. There's in fact even a scene where Precious imagines her and her mother um, superimposed within, within one of the TV shows. Um, the, I think the point there is that that popular, popular culture perhaps asks us to be more docile in our very bodies than uh, than a, than, a, than a actively engaged civically society, a civic, civic society should be. Um, perhaps we're more docile than we should be if we're to be actively engaged as citizens. Um, which is pretty much the last point. Um, you know, as a teacher, I really believe in embodied learning that you don't have to check your whole stories at the door in order to get what you need to get out of class. You know, that you can be in, in class with your whole bodies and be moving if you want to be moving and not just still. Uh, part of my, my embodiment um, is, to, is to talk about 
the emergence of South Asian Americans in popular culture, because that's pretty much one of the only places of reflection that I had growing up in this country. So, thank you for listening. I'm open to questions. South Asia already had its own versions of hip hop in traditional folk songs that was overlaid by a colonial period um, set of norms that the British had. And, and now I think it's reemerging mixed with hip hop. I mean, there's things that come over from the US, definitely, but it completely fits with traditional music styles that I've studied. And that's what excites me about it is how now we can see this really wonderful mesh between what was in South Asia before, colonial period of repression, I would say, and then re-emerging now with a new freedom, which I think is really exciting. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you've had that, if you are familiar with that stuff or not. Yeah, so I think that's a really great point. So that, it goes back to what I was saying about there, there being four elements of hip hop, and that the, those four elements are actually core to almost any, to almost any culture, the movement, the speech, et cetera. Um, and I always say that who, who created hip hop, well we all did in some ways because it, uh, it does continue with this cultural trajectory of an oral, an oral, an oral history tradition. Only thing is, is that we still want to give props to hip hop coming out of the South Bronx, a particular form as it's held, as it's then commodified. The commodification problematizes it a little bit and um, you know, if we look at hip hop as a, as a tiered terrain of citizenship, one of the things that we're asked to accept through hip hop as its post commodification are, is, for example, a, a narrow idea of masculinity. That then becomes problematic when it's imported. Do you know what I'm saying? And like, I feel like masculinity within the South Asian context, even though it's, it's um, stereotyped through, through characters like Abu, I think it could really inform masculinity here. Something that could be more multi-layered, um, able to hold hands. Wow, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, but I feel you. I feel you on what you're saying that there's an, a lot of cross-pollination there. Can you um, expand on that? Because I know that was that Indian um, Well, bowel, bowel music is the, the best example that I would have. I mean, because I'm familiar with it. Because it's all about people who are oppressed, people who are going through various issues coming up with a poetry that expresses that. And then now, once people become famous, then they become, they, then it becomes their song. So Purnandas Baal, he has his copyrighted songs that were passed down for 200 years. Hmm. But now he, he makes it on a, a label, gets recorded by you know um, some record label in, in Calcutta, and now it becomes his song. So then it becomes copyrighted. So some of the same kinds of things that you're talking about, I think, have happened in India as well. But, yeah. But it's, and then the Punjabi stuff that's coming out now, which is, um, you know, Bhangra. Bhangra is, is definitely a, the same type of, I mean, the songs that are sung in Jumur and Bhangra are the same types of things that are going on in, in a lot of the hip hop stuff that I've mm -hmm. heard. I'm really predisposed to excellent mixes, I have to say. You know what, you raised another good point, though, about, about yourself, that you grew up there and I grew up here. But I think. Um, just to add to that, that one of the one of the reasons why I'm interested in this emergence is that being American is so many things. So yeah, I grew up in the physical confines of the country, but I grew up in an Indian household. I grew up going to bhajans. I grew up with my parents. Um, I grew up within an Indian community that was pretty intricately webbed across castes, across across regions. When people when people say you know you're American, generally they think white. 
That's true. And it's true also because it's true, it's been true in my life anyway. It's true also because of how America is portrayed through popular culture, like blockbusters like the Titanic, for example, um, which give off the impression that this is all America is. So when I'm talking about the emergence of South Asians into American popular culture, I'm also talking about our emergence as Americans on a global plane of visibility. So that, that way there could be maybe a more nuanced understanding of what it might mean to grow up in this country. You know? So I, I really like how you talk a lot about how um, South Asian influence in hip hop in the American context has been more of empowering and it's, it's something we can definitely look forward to. I'm wondering what your opinions are on, so I think there's like one or two Timbaland tracks where he like samples in like old school Indian music. So I'm wondering how you feel about like the appropriation of Indian music or like samples into hip hop tracks because I mean, like, driving a car with my mom, who's first generation here, is that song, versus, like, me, second generation. It's always interesting to see that, like, different perspectives and different opinions on it. Yeah, I'm curious about what you think about that, too. Um, but, so I'll answer your question. There's two things that come to mind initially. One is that when it first started happening, I was like, yo, yo, yo. I'm not just a sample, a hook. <laughs> you know, we, we are full songs here. We are full song people here. You know, so um, uh, I felt also that it was very, um, that was deeply sexualized, yeah, hypersexualized. That's, that's and as a woman, um, I've always uh, felt torn uh, between one of the things that, for example, Ishmael Reed raises in his response to Precious, which is that there's a kind of, and now I don't always agree with Ishmael Reed, all right, but he raises an interesting point, which is that African American uh, men and women are often pitted against each other in the context of the stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like a, a similar thing happens with, with Indian men and women, South Asian men and women, which is that the men are demasculinized in some ways, and we're hypersexualized mm -hmm. as women. How are we supposed to relate against that then wide gulf of how we're accepted in society? Um, another thing is that, you know, and it, it takes me back to, to the historicizing hip hop in a globalized context, you know, there's a song where there's a woman singing um, from a Bollywood song, and the response of the rapper is, whatever she said, then I'm that, you know? And I'm like, well, why don't you just find out what she said and just like respond to that? You don't have to continue to otherize it in your own response. Um, I think that there's far more room, uh, a lot of growing edge around how hip hop can relate to, to Indianness. But we have a lot of deep connections too. Africa Bombada almost went to India, mm -hmm. he didn't. You know, um, India's uh, like all up through the history. How does it feel for you when you hear the samples? I don't know, it's different because my whole like gender equal stance is of course like, you know, looking at the exoticization and hypersexualization of Asian women, not just South Asian, but Asian women in general, has always been something that's bothered me um, in the second generation. And then for my mom, She's always raised us with, you know, the beauty and the poetry of lyrics. Not just like Urdu or Hindi or Punjabi, but like the actual meaning of the songs is poetic. Like that's, that's a huge part of music. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I remember when, I think, I don't remember who it was, but it's, it's not even like the song being sampled, but it's the parts of the song that is sampled that, that I guess concern me. And then I remember when, you know, my sister, someone first told me about Jay Sean, it was big because it was a full song by an Indian artist that was popular. And I remember for me, I mean, as excited as I was, once again, I was like, okay, well, there's an Indian man. And there's still that, like, dissonance between the genders and who's getting sampled and who's getting full track. <laughs> um, and even with, like, MIA, I mean, that was always an interesting conversation because I have so many friends who are Sri Lankan, Sinhalese. So when we talk about that and the whole how she uses that medium as an expression for like her political beliefs. I mean, that in itself was like all my American friends are like, oh, there's a genocide going on in Sri Lanka, and they're getting the skewed perception based off of one individual's music. So I mean, it's always a fight because a lot of times being a minority in a majority culture, you're kind of tokenized. And while you always are, you know, when a Jay Sean song comes on, even if I don't like it, I'm like, yeah, and I turn it up. But, I mean, to a large point, it, it is, 
it's frustrating, you know, like, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just real quick before we're moving on. I mean, that that's also why I think that that brittle that brittle context that precious lands in that also slum dog lands in that it wouldn't be so brittle if we had a more abundant marketplace of ideas if we had more representations of ourselves that were full people wouldn't mind so much if there was one movie that came out no matter how many accolades yeah. yeah 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 it would be less of a freak out situation that's a great way to put it what, um, what did you think about Sita an animated film, um, a, a retelling of the story of Sita and Ram. Yeah, it's like the Ramayan, but with American. I'll show you. We showed it. I've seen it. Yes. Oh yeah. And yeah. it has just. Uh, what do you think? It bothered me. Yeah, my parents. Oh my God. To the, the you know the, the solemnity, the beauty, the sacredness of the text, we just uh, kind of commercialize it. That's what half the movies in oh. about Jesus do too. <laughs> that's the thing. Jesus Christ, the star. Get me used to it. I think there's a difference for me. That's true. Like who's making the movie? You know what I mean? And I mean, I'm, I'm constantly torn because being second generation, it's like yay, something from our culture is out there. But then. Like so many family friends were like, was like, what did my dad's best friends? Someone had a couple of drinks and took a crap on the Ramayan. Like they were very, very mm -hmm. against. I mean, a few, a few of my friends in New York City who are active South Asians in the community are in that movie as voices. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, like this man named Asim Chabra, who's a journalist, and he was one of the three, mm -hmm. which I thought the, the chorus was pretty engaging. Oh, yeah. um, they were also drawn so beautifully. Yes, creative. In terms of what I thought, like honestly, I, I could relate to her, I, her use of blues music as something that gave her that um, that that lovesick feeling, all right. At the same time, the whole structure of it being around her constantly proving herself, constantly getting you know dumped on by her man, that was hard to swallow. However, the actual story itself is not so different from that thing. When we when we respect Sita so much, Ram Sita, and you know, we we also it helped me to think about oh because otherwise. When I go to temples and I'm praying, like, I hadn't really thought about, well, but look at all that Sita went through, though, you know? So I, I, I don't, I'm not saying that it was perfect, but I appreciated its, 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 um, its content, its form, the, the animation, how it yeah. endeavored, what it endeavored to do, I appreciate it, definitely. You, you weren't feeling it, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially the, the sub-story when they went to Trivandrum. Perhaps another example might might be illustrative though around that whole thing of someone saying that someone had a couple drinks and then just I remember um, going to see an Indian classical dance performance in Pittsburgh with my parents. Uh, it, you know, it was like students, young women in the thing, and there was one uh, moment when the choreographer herself came out, and she did just a few things a little bit different, just a few sort of fusion things, yeah. very subtle, yeah. very subtle, and the whole performance in general by all the uncles and aunties was kind of derided as not being classical enough, mm -hmm. as disrespecting the genre. Um, it reminds me then of how the Afghan women are responded to by, you know, even even being on screen, that you're going outside of something and you're not supposed to do that, and when you do that, it's really bad. Now, I, I just, I feel like also as a diaspora, we could be, um, we might come up off of being a little more flexible, maybe, at the same time needing to, needing to police our imagery to some extent. Yeah, we need to keep the integrity of that story, but at the same time, try to make it yeah, modern, but not too hard. Um, it reminds me a little bit of Shamla Morty's work. Did, have you seen it with Rise, where she does, she's, it was for the South Asian conference that we had a couple years ago. She was commenting on, she's making a comparison between fundamentalist violence in 9-11 versus fundamentalist violence in the 2005 Gujarati riots, right? And as she's doing it, she's doing it in dance form. Half of her body, she's um, 
her mother is Euro-American, her father is Indian. Half of her body is literally performing ballet, classical ballet. The other half is doing Bharatanatyam at the same time. <laughs> In order to get the, to, to literally make a visual image of the angst and of the, the move to, to togetherness, mm. but still separate. Mm. And it's really fascinating. Um, it's fascinating. Mm. I'd love to see that play. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.